Well, hello and welcome everyone to another session in the Solid Finances series. I'm glad you could join us today. A few housekeeping notes before we get started here. Um, first of all, I want to thank our sponsors, which is the Montana State University Extension, uh, University of Idaho Extension, NDSU Extension, um, and also K-State um, University Extension as well. So those are the four organizations that help make this program available to you. A um, couple of reminders. Um, first of all, our website is a wonderful resource. We put all of our recordings there for past sessions. We also have links to the resources, so if there were handouts, related websites, um, those kind of things, um, we post those there as well. Also, if you've got a question, a suggestion for a uh, future session, uh, clarification you want, uh, contact information for uh, uh, myself and Carrie Johnson is there as well, so if you can get the your question into us, we'd be happy to try to get that answered for you or possibly schedule a future session on that topic. So um, do bookmark that site if you haven't done so already. We do try to make each of these sessions as interactive as possible. Um, one of the ways we do that is we have a question and answer pod, so feel free to send your questions in um, through the bottom. It is anonymous when they come in. Um, we'll just say we've had a question come in or a comment, um, and we'll try to um, get to those as we go along, and anything we miss, we'll try to catch up at the end of the session. And then we'll also be asking for uh, your opinion on several things, um, so we'll ask some poll questions, and again, those are anonymous as well. Quick scheduling note, our final two sessions for this academic year will be on March 21st and March 28th. Um, so it'll be a couple week break before we come back and Carrie Johnson will talk about student loan repayments and then Serene Greenway from the University, or from Idaho State University Extension, uh, we'll talk about protecting yourself from financial scams on our March 28th. So mark your calendars um, and again note we won't be here next week or the following week. Um, we'll have about a two week break and then we'll be back um, for the remainder of the series. Today, um, I'll be your presenter, and we're going to talk a little bit about home loans. Um, last week, many of you may have joined Kerry Johnson talk about the home buying process. Um, several years ago, we, we kind of combined these two topics into one session, and we found out we had way too much material for uh, one hour, so we um, divided that up and spent a little more time in detail on both. So um, we will refer back some to last week. So just a quick review here. Um, last week's session, uh, Gary talked about applying for a loan, getting pre-qualified, finding a realtor, um, property taxes. She talked to, um, about home inspections, closing date, length of time, doing a final walkthrough. Some good tips on those things. So I'm going to try not to cover much of those today. Um, but I would encourage you to go view that recording if you haven't seen it and you want um, to find out a little more about those. Now, what I want to um, spend most of our time on today, I want to talk a little bit about some different types of loans and lenders. Um, talking about getting some quotes, what those might look like. We'll talk about uh, loans for a home purchase. Um, and also um, loans for refinancing a current loan. So those are kind of be the main topics we've got. If anyone has a specific topic or question that they would like um, addressed or are hoping to hear an answer to today, feel free to put that in the question and answer pod. And if it's um, not something we're going to cover, we'll try to um, see if we can address it at one of the uh, pauses or at the end. So please feel free to send that in in the question and answer pod. So first of all, I want to know just a little bit about um, who's with us today here, a little bit about your situation. So um, if you could tell me what you're on the poll here, do you currently have a home mortgage? All right. So we've got a nice mix here. We got about 35% uh, saying yes and about 65% uh, saying no. Um, well, that's great. We've got some uh, things I think that will be useful for both groups. Um, let me ask one more poll before we get started here. Are you considering buying a home or refinancing your current home in, let's say, the next 12 months? All right, so we got a mix here with some saying yes, some saying maybe, and uh, about half of folks saying no. So, all right, well, that gives me a good idea, a little bit of uh, a 
little bit of your situation. Um, so now let me uh, get started with a couple things. So first of all, let's talk about some of our real common mortgages, kind of the, the normal um, for the industry. Um, there's several different types of lenders. And you know, we may all think of a bank or a credit union. There's also things called mortgage companies. Um, and then there's also some specialty loan programs. And we'll talk a little bit about those as well. And then we commonly see a 30-year mortgage as kind of the industry standard, but there's also other lengths like 15 years um, or 5, 10, or 20 years as well. So we'll talk some about choosing between those. And then we'll also talk about how your interest rate is set. Um, oftentimes it's a fixed rate, um, which is going to be the same throughout the life of the loan. And then we also have what are called adjustable rate mortgages or ARMS as well. And then we'll talk about how points kind of uh, fit in with um, the rates as well. So first, let's talk a little bit about types of lenders. So one of the most common and probably the first thing that comes to most people's mind is a depository institution. It's probably not the word they use, but this is a bank or a credit union where you can have a savings account or a checking account, and they'll take deposits from your money. Historically, that's been the role of financial institutions um, like banks and credit unions is to take essentially money from people's uh, <laughs> savings accounts and checking accounts that they're not using and reloan them out to other people. Um, so depository institutions are still a big part of the mortgage um, system in uh, America today. We also have seen the rise over the last um, several decades of what we call non-depository mortgage lenders. You may also hear the name mortgage broker because they oftentimes work with these folks, but you may see something like ABC Mortgage Company. They may have a physical office in your community. It's not all internet based. Um, many of these are nationwide or statewide. Um, and it may have the name like you know XYZ Financial Services. So those those top two there. Um, generally, what those folks do is they um, take loan applications just like a bank would. You fill out all the same type of information. They do the credit check. They do all of those kind of things. But what's different about those lenders is um, essentially they're reselling those as bonds almost immediately. Now, banks are often going to resell your mortgage as well and pool it with others, but they may hold it for a period of 30 to 60 days um, or you know, choose to hold it, I guess, longer as well. But it's pretty rare even for banks. So they're oftentimes going to be resold into what we call the secondary market. So um, these type of financial services companies, they're going to be doing that um, essentially automatically almost with every single loan. So the value they're providing really is they're doing the credit check on you, they're doing the application, and then they're matching you up with... Um, a secondary mortgage um, instrument that allows them to lend that money to you. And then on a very much smaller portion, uh, we also see a little bit of peer-to-peer -peer lending. And this has become a little bit more common recently, but generally not for mortgages. And this is where, you know, typically through an internet-based um, platform, um, individuals are going to almost loan directly to people. Um, and you're probably only going to loan a small portion of the total loan to somebody. So if somebody wants a $10,000 car loan, I may be purchasing $800 of that um, $10,000 uh, car purchase. So you do see a little bit of that in the mortgage industry, but it's not very common. Now there's also a lot of specialty loan programs, and we could spend an awful lot of time on these, and I know Carrie touched on them last week, and it, it's kind of hard to say a whole lot about these because each of them is so specific. Um, Typically, these types of loan programs um, are targeted at a very specific group of individuals or a very specific geography. Um, so oftentimes, these programs have like um, a maximum income level. So it's targeted to help home ownership for families that make under $50,000. And it may be only in a particular county or city. Um, it, there are other programs that are broader, like the Veterans Administration has a loan program that allows veterans um, to essentially have a little bit easier credit standards um, to make a purchase. There's also FHA um, loans, which is through the Federal Housing Administration. USDA has a program through their Rural Development Program. Um, but all of these kind of have that same idea. If you meet the qualifications, they can provide some preferential treatment in terms of Maybe you need less of a down payment. Maybe you don't require um, private mortgage insurance. Maybe they can be a little more flexible on your income history. But all of those programs um, exist. There can also be some much more narrow ones. I mean, it could possibly be the city you're um, living in has a particular initiative to help. You know, sometimes you see them with um, teachers or um, law enforcement to make sure that the sort of city employees can live in the city they work in. So um, I had an acquaintance that uh, 
lived in Las Vegas for a while, and they had a program there for um, to get teachers who taught at low-income schools to live in that district. Um, so they had a beneficial loan program um, to help teachers do that. So it can be a variety of those. If you happen to qualify for those, um, oftentimes it can be a um, very beneficial arrangement for the borrowers. So. And one thing with those loans is oftentimes they are in partnership with a bank or multiple banks or credit unions. So if you're getting a VA loan, you still may be working with a bank. It's just that um, the paperwork they're going to file is a little bit different, and they're going to kind of match you up directly into that. Now, other programs you may apply through the organization that's offering it. So if you're working with Habitat for Humanity, you may be applying via Habitat for Humanity instead of through a bank. Um, but it is something good to ask your um, lender um, if you think you might be eligible or ask if there's any special programs that uh, you might um, qualify for. But generally those are going to have a you know, veteran status or they're going to have an income limitation or first time home buyers, some, some programs like that. So let me ask another question of everyone here. What type of lender did you use for your most recent mortgage? Great. We got a mix of uh, different answers here, which is excellent, or we got a bank leading the way. We had somebody or several people indicate other. If you want to indicate, if you're willing to share that in the question and answer pod, um, what that other type of lender was, um, that would be great. Okay, so which of these is best? Well, um, there's a number of different situations, and really all of them could be best depending on the situation. Um, so a depository lender, this is, you know, your bank or credit union, oftentimes you're going to be applying at your bank. So where your checking account is, where your savings account. Um, so you've probably got a relationship with that bank to some extent. They know what your account balance has been, if you've had overdraft, um, those kind of things. Um, and that relationship can work to your advantage. Um, especially if you've got a good relationship with that lender and they've got a track record with you. Um, they can also be beneficial if you need to have something a little bit unusual take place with your loan. So maybe you're um, selling your current home but you want to keep it until the end of July but you'd like to move into your new home on July 1st. So they may be able to provide some financing for a month where you'll have two homes that might be a little bit harder to arrange um, with a different type of lender. So. A depository lender can be um, valuable there. Um, they may also be able to do some things in terms of if you have an unusual length or um, I know I had uh, an acquaintance who, who built a house that used uh, solar power instead of being connected to the electrical grid um, and uh, some of the other lenders had difficulty because that loan then was non-conforming so a local depositor actually made that loan but they did not resell it which is um, a little bit unusual. So they had the ability to do that because they were a depository institution. Um, Non-depository lenders, um, sometimes these work with mortgage brokers or a mortgage company. They don't have physical offices a lot of times. Sometimes they do, but sometimes their overhead's a little bit lower. They're not having branches in many, many places. Um, and it's also maybe you can shop around a bit. So they may be, your local broker may be a representative for three or four different mortgage companies. So they might be able to shop around and get you the best deal. Um, you don't always necessarily know what the relationship between that lender and the office you're meeting in and those kind of things. So it can be a little less transparent and you probably don't have nearly the relationship with that type of lender that you might with a depository lender. And then these special programs, again, eligibility is usually pretty narrowly defined, um, but usually um, they're offering some benefit to borrowers who are able to uh, meet those eligibility requirements. So that I would say the paperwork oftentimes a little more and the restrictions on being eligible um, are probably higher. However, the terms of those loans are probably beneficial to the borrowers in, in some way. So any of the three could be a great choice. Now let's talk a little bit about fixed rate loans. This is certainly the most common. So on a fixed rate loan, the interest rate is going to be constant for the life of the loan. And then your payments are going to be constant as well. Um, and this is going to be, that's excluding your homeowner's insurance and any property taxes um, that you might be paying at the same time as your um, 
normal mortgage payment. But your principal and interest, the total is going to be the same on payment one as it is on payment 360 or you know 120 or whatever that might be. Um, so here's just a couple examples. Last week I went and uh, got some online quotes um, from a couple of different lenders. And what you can see here is um, for a 30-year loan there is some variation. Um, but last week they were between 4.12 and 4.25%. Now this may not be the rate exactly in your local area. I had to put in my zip code, what my credit score would be, and I put in that I would be putting down 25% um, down payment. If you put a lesser down payment, you know the rates may change some. If you're in a different uh, zip code, they may um, change as well. Now, 15-year loans tend to have lower interest rates. The gap between the two is actually narrower than it has been. Um, at least a couple of years ago, I had taught a similar session and, and put some slides together like this, and the gap between the two was wider. But here we see it ranging essentially from about a half a percent difference um, down to only a quarter of a percent, depending on which lender um, we're looking at here. Um, and then the 10-year, all three of these lenders actually had the same rate as well. Now, I didn't list here, but if you wanted a loan for 25 years, or if you wanted a loan for 20 years, or five years, um, probably your lender is going to have no problem being able to make that type of loan as well. Generally, we see as the uh, when we're in a low interest rate environment, which we have been for a while, we're going to see those shorter terms be the lower rates. Okay, so taking a 10-year loan is likely to give you a better interest rate than a 30-year loan. Now, one of the trade-offs, um, because of that situation where we tend to have lower rates um, with the shorter loans, um, making higher payments by going to a 15-year loan um, will get you a lower interest rate, but then because you're also paying it off quicker, you're going to pay a whole lot less in total interest. So just one example here, a 30-year mortgage for $200,000 at 4.25%, your monthly payment, just the principal and interest portion, um, would be $984. Okay, so over the life of that loan, you're going to pay over $150,000 in interest payments to your lender. Now, if um, you did a 15-year loan, still for $200,000, current interest rates are about a you know 0.25% less. The monthly payment is going to be about $500 more. It's going to be $1,479, but your total interest payments over the life of the loan is going to be $66,000. So you're saving about $90,000 in interest um, by paying essentially $500 more um, each month. So sometimes you see people try to shorten the term. Maybe they can't go all the way to a 15. Maybe they go to a 20-year. Um, but one, the the... Higher monthly payments are going to pay off the loan quicker, so that helps you reduce interest. But then oftentimes you do get a lower rate um, as well when you go to the shorter loan. I know my personal situation, we refinanced probably five years ago, um, and we're able to get a, over a percentage point lower in interest rate to go to a 15-year loan. So because we had been you know, partially into the 30-year and had paid off um, some of the principal there, our payments ended up going up by like $100 a month to take about eight years off the life of my loan, um, going to a 15-year, partially because I was able to take advantage of that lower interest rate. Now, um, adjustable rate loans, I think um, Sometimes people just say, too risky, I don't want to consider it. Um, but I think that there are, is a role for adjustable rate loans, and they might be the right choice for you. But you need to make sure you have that right situation. So first of all, an interest rate on an adjustable rate loan can change over the life of the loan. Okay? And oftentimes you are going to hear these um, type of loans referred to as ARMS, which is just adjustable rate mortgage. So you see ARM, quite common, with a small s after it, ARMS. So, and the typical quote from a bank or a lender is going to look something like, you know, 4.125%, and then it's going to say 5 slash 1, might be what's after that. So, the uh, 4 and 1 eighth percent interest that they quoted there is going to be your interest rate for the first five years. So, you're going to make, these were both 30 year loans, so you're going to make 60 payments 
um, based on that four four and an eight percent um, interest rate. And then each year after year five, it's going to adjust. Okay, and it's going to adjust based on a published interest rates that out that's published in the Wall Street Journal. So it might be the prime rate, it might be LIBOR. There's a variety of different kind of market average rates that are out there. And what it might say is something like prime rate plus 2%. Prime rate's usually essentially almost an interest-free rate, so it'll be plus something. Um, you could also see what's called a 7-1 adjustment. So this particular bank was offering 4.25% with a 7-1. So again, the rate was fixed for seven years and then adjust each year after that. Sometimes they limit how much the interest rate can go up in a particular adjustment period. So it may say that, you know, we're at 4.25%, but in one year, the rate can never rise by more than 1% or 1.5%. So um, it's good to take a look and see what your contract says in terms of how that adjustment takes place what underlying interest rate, like prime or LIBOR, it's based on, um, and also if there's any caps on how much it can adjust in, in each adjustment period. Um, one of the reasons people um, are interested in variable rate loans is um, typically they do have lower interest rates than a fixed rate loan. So if we were going out in the market today, the, the fixed rate um, price from this same lender was 4.375 4 or 4.38%. And, um, and you can see we're about a either an eighth or a quarter of a percentage point less than that um, using a variable rate loan. And part of that is a risk story. The lender has less risk because they're transferring some of that back to you. So why might we consider this? Well, again, just some numbers based on that example. If we had a $150,000 loan um, on a fixed rate loan from that lender, our payment's going to be $749. If we took their offer for the adjustable rate mortgage um, and we did 4.125% and it's fixed for five years, um, the payment's going to be $727. So $22 per month less by taking the adjustable rate loan. So one consideration you might want to um, think about if you're considering an adjustment rate, how long do you expect to live in this home? If you expect to live there for 15 years, um, you have to worry about what those payments will be after the fixed period. If you're planning to move in four years, um, the five-year fixed rate period on the adjustable rate mortgage will be fixed. So essentially you're just getting a fixed rate for your four-year period at a little bit lower um, rate. And then you may also want to think about what you expect rates to do down the road. We've Interest rates have risen some over the last six to nine months, but if we compare them to, say, a 30-year average, we're still well below the uh, interest rates for a 30-year average. So what do you think rates are going to do in seven years or five years when your fixed period ends? Um, if you think they're going to decrease, um, that could be a reason to do an adjustable rate loan if you're worried they're going to increase maybe you'd like to lean more towards a fixed rate. So, um, And then alternatively, what, could, what would you be able to handle higher payments if rates did rise? So if you go ahead and take this adjustable rate loan and save your $22 a month for the first five years, and then when you get down the road five years, um, rates rise by $20 or $40 or $80, you know, would you be able to handle that in your budget. So just some things to consider if you're um, thinking about an adjustable rate mortgage. Points is another um, question that uh, I get a lot of um, people contacting me about. Um, points is essentially just a fee you pay to your lender up front when you get a loan. Um, and why would you pay these? Well, it's because they typically give you a lower interest rate because you paid them some money up front. Um, so a point, you may see it, uh, a quote for something, um, something along this, like 4.375% interest, as long as you pay 1.1 points. Well, how much is a point? Well, it's based on the value of the loan you're going to take. So we multiply them. You can think of 1.1 as 1.1% of the value of the loan. So 1.1 points means that when you take that loan out, they're going to charge you $2,200. Now, in exchange for that, you're going to get a better interest rate than if you didn't 
pay the points. So the same lender here, if you were willing to pay two points, um, you'd get an interest rate that's an eighth of a percentage lower. So in this particular example from this particular lender, um, paying an extra $1,800 lowers your monthly payments by $15. So is that a good deal? Well, it depends on a couple different things. One of which is um, just a quick calculation of how long is it going to take you to recover your $1,800. So we can easily do a little bit of math if we want and say $1,800, then I say $15 a month. After I make 120 payments, essentially I'll have gotten my $1,800 back. Okay. Now, taxes are always um, an important consideration when we're thinking about mortgage interest. Many of us are able to itemize our deductions on our tax return and deduct things like mortgage interest. We can also deduct mortgage points as well. Um, now, teaching this class over the past few years, I've commonly said, take a look at your tax return from last year and look to see if you itemize deductions. Um, because there is a point where we can just take a standard deduction and then we don't do the itemizing. Um, so. Overall, that might be your best situation, but if we're specifically looking narrowly at our uh, mortgage decision here, um, if you're able to itemize that, it's kind of like a discount on those payments that we're making. Now, we had a tax law change that um, was passed in late December of 2017 with most of the changes um, starting for the 2018 tax year. So many of us, if we're filing our taxes, it's not the one we're working on right now. It's the tax return we'll be working on one year from now. But we had a big increase in the standard deduction. Essentially, it almost doubled to $24,000 for married couples, um, big increase for singles as well. Um, but what that means, that might be good for your overall tax situation, but it might mean that many of you are no longer itemizing your deduction. So that means the tax um, benefits that you were getting for paying mortgage interest um, are going to not be there for next year. So it'll kind of be like your um, discount um, for paying those um, interest amounts may go away. And the same is also going to be true for points. Um, so points you pay up front and there's a special publication called IRS Publication 530 that really goes into detail about how these are deductible. Um, and then IRS Publication 936 talks about mortgage interest as well. So um, be a little bit careful. Uh, a little more thought goes into knowing whether it's um, taxable or tax deductible or not. Um, and we can't just look at last year's return because of the changes we had to the tax law. So um, we can get a little more in depth than the just saying 120 payments will make the break even. All right, um, let me pause here to see if we've got any questions. All right, so we do have a question that's come in. Um, the question is, are there ever um, mortgage interest rate um, offers from your lender that don't involve points? Um, yes, that's absolutely true. Um, the, your lender will probably have a rate that is for zero points and, and a rate that maybe goes all the way up to maybe two or two and a half points. Usually you don't see much more than um, two and a half percent being asked um, in terms of total points. So. Um, very good uh, question. Thank you for sending that in. Let's talk a little bit about private mortgage insurance. Um, I know one of you sent this in earlier that this was the uh, question or topic we were, you were hoping that we would uh, cover today. Um, private uh, mortgage insurance, sometimes referred to as PMI, is insurance paid by the borrower, so that's me if I'm going into a bank, to protect the lender in case I default. So this is a little different than your auto insurance, right? So if, um, if I crash into somebody, rather than me having to pay to fix their car, my auto insurance company does it for me. In this case, if I don't make my payments, um, it lets the lender recover money for that, but I don't get any benefit. I'm still liable for the whole amount. So it's a little different type of insurance. There's not really a direct benefit to the borrower other than that you may entice a lender to lend to you who might have otherwise not um, been willing to lend to you. Generally it's required if the down payment is less than 20% of the purchase price. So $200,000 home, if you make a down payment less than $40,000, it's quite likely you'll be required to purchase private mortgage insurance in, able to, in order to get your loan. 
Now, there are some exceptions to this. The Veterans Administration loans, FHA loans, commonly um, have a method to avoid private mortgage insurance sort of built into them. So that's one of the benefits if you're eligible for some of those programs. Now, what does this insurance cost? Um, well, it's going to vary based on the amount of the loan and the loan-to-value ratio. So what I mean by that is if we put a $38,000 down payment down, our private mortgage insurance is going to be less each month than if we had put $3,000 down payment down. So as you get closer to that 80% level, um, the cost is going to vary. Um, different insurance companies will have different um, quotes. Oftentimes your lender is going to select that private mortgage insurance company for you or at least have a recommendation that most people are simply going to go with. Um, you may ask if you want, if you'd like to shop around and see if a uh, different insurance company provides a better option, but I would say most people don't tend to do that. Um, they take the one that's offered to them. And then your credit score, credit strength application, those kind of things will uh, matter as well. Generally, we somewhere see, see somewhere between a half a percent to five percent um, of the value of the mortgage is kind of a common premium amount. So $180,000 loan might mean you have a $900 annual premium or about $75 a month. Okay. Now, private mortgage insurance does not um, need to be paid for the entire life of the loan. It can generally be canceled once the loan to value ratio reaches 80%. So if we had taken this $200,000 um, home and we put a 10% down payment down, 80% um, of the loan to value is going to be $160,000 when we reach that level. Um, so on a 30-year mortgage, it's going to take us 72 payments to get down to that um, $160,000 level. If we had a 15-year um, loan, after 27 payments, we'd be um, down to that $160,000 level. Now, there's a couple things I want to point out about this. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to make 72 private mortgage insurance payments, or 27, depending on which loan you chose. Um, first of all, sometimes we make extra principal payments, so that could affect when we get there. Um, but also, um, I know this was a situation I had when we had our first loan. Um, we did not put 20% down, so we had private mortgage insurance. Um, after 20 months, we had made some extra principal payments, and we had reached that 80% level. Um, and it said in the fine print of my mortgage that um, private mortgage insurance cannot be canceled for the 24 months regardless of the balance. So we were stuck paying three months of private mortgage insurance when we had met the 80% level as well. Um, sometimes there may be a requirement that an appraisal be obtained to cancel the mortgage insurance, especially if you're doing it prior to kind of the automatic cancellation date. Now, an appraisal might cost you $300. So if your private mortgage insurance is $40 a month, you're essentially $300. Um, you know, it's about six months worth of premiums just to cover the cost of getting the appraisal that allows you to cancel the insurance. So there can sometimes be a cost. Most of these um, mortgages will have an automatic cancellation, but oftentimes that's going to be at about 78% and not 80. So your 72 payments that got you to 160,000, um, you might have to make an additional five or six or seven payments to get down to that level, or maybe even more um, to get to the 78%, and then maybe automatically um, removed. Now, if we're in a situation where um, market prices have changed a lot, like in 2008, when um, housing prices dipped, um, some lenders get a little hesitant and require appraisals. Um, but also, maybe your home's value has gone up a lot, and you might want to check and see what the terms are to see if you bought a house for 200000 four years later it's worth $250,000. Um, can you cancel because the value has gone up? Does that affect it? And, and you may need to check. It may or may not allow that. Last week, uh, Carrie Johnson talked about closing costs and fees. The only um, component of this slide I wanted to mention um, with respect to choosing home loans is sometimes banks have an origination fee. They also have a credit report fee sometimes and a bank processing fee. Um, ask around and see what those fees are. It may vary from lender to lender, and you may be able to get a 
better rate even if both lenders are offering four and a half percent interest one may have a hundred dollar origination fee and one may have twenty dollars and one may have none so those are just some things that you can also compare and maybe negotiate a bit on um, one thing I want to show real quick one of the resources that we've got um, for today hopefully everyone is now seeing uh, my screen and um, on that screen is just one of the resources um, that I listed for today. If you're going to compare lenders um, or different offers from the same lender, um, there's a nice sheet that's put out there. Um, this one's by the Federal Trade Commission, um, but I've put that link on the resources page. So you can fill it out and you can see what the different appraisal fees might be, what the interest rate is, how long you want to keep private mortgage insurance, um, all of those kind of things. And they have this nice chart out there. Um, basically it lists kind of everything you would want to know um, on this one sheet so you fill this out it'll probably make that shopping for a mortgage a little bit easier so but again that is linked I just wanted to point that one out one of the things that you're gonna want to know um, with these is you know listing what the rate is monthly payments if it's adjustable those kind of things so that worksheet that I just showed you is going to give you a place to write all those down in a nice organized way so let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk a little bit about refinancing loans with our last uh, 15 minutes or so here. Um, have you ever refinanced a loan? All right, so uh, about 35% are saying yes and about 62% uh, are saying no. Okay, good, glad we've got a mix of folks there. So, uh, simple definition, we're essentially getting a new loan that's gonna pay off our current loan. Um, there is another resource page, and if we have time, I'll show it to you. I also linked this on our resources page. The Federal Reserve Board put out this guide to refinancing, and it's probably 10 or 12 years old now. Um, and a few of the numbers in it are getting a little bit dated, but they have a really nice chart that's much like the one I just showed you, except it talks about just refinancing, comparing your current payment to an alternative and to see if it helps meet your need. And I haven't found a newer resource that does as good a job as that chart. So I did put that link up there. Um, you'll notice a few other things, say the average in you know 2004 was this, and it's because that's getting a little bit dated. But the chart that they have is just a wonderful chart for um, comparing some things. So let's talk about some different reasons to refinance, and I'll, and I'll give you a couple examples um, as well. One is to lower the interest over the life of the loan. So um, if someone had taken out a 30-year mortgage, they're halfway through paying it off, maybe interest rates have dropped, um, so their initial interest rate you know, was 5.5%, um, they have 15 years left, they could go to, the, to a lender and refinance and maybe there's a newer lower rate for a 15-year mortgage to 4.5%, so this saves them uh, interest over the life of that loan. So that's a common reason. This is what... Um, pushed me to do a refinancing five or six years ago in our home was to take advantage of lower interest rates um, that had come up. Reduce the monthly payment amount is another reason. Um, so it could be that your monthly payment is $1,100. You're halfway through a 30-year mortgage at 4.5%, and um, maybe 30-year mortgages are still at 4.5%, but you stretch it back out to 30 years. So you're adding years on to the end of it, but your monthly payment amount drops. And I can give you kind of two examples of some folks that have come to me and, and we've uh, talked through some things for some different people's situations. And one was we had a family that um, they were expecting their first child and uh, the mother was going to leave the workforce. They were going to go from a two income household to a one. So they essentially did something very similar to this that um, lowered their monthly payments um, and allowed them to live and budget on a, being a one income household. So that helped them meet the needs they wanted to. Now one spouse could leave the workforce and stay home with the child. Um, another situation that um, I had somebody come to me like this is uh, they were retiring and they um, were moving, but they wanted to keep their current house as a rental because they felt they would return to it someday. But they wanted the rent from the renter to pay for kind of all the expenses related to the house. So if we kind of 
uh, piggybacked on this example, they might have been expecting like $1,000 in rent each month, um, which wouldn't cover the 1100 so they refinanced it for a longer period, and now the monthly renter payments covered the mortgage and also some repairs as well. So um, that allowed them to move and do the things they wanted to do, but have this house kind of pay for itself um, while it waited in case they decided they wanted to return. A third reason, um, we don't see this quite as often because I don't see too many people take adjustable rate mortgages, but it could be that you've, um, you have an adjustable rate mortgage and it's been adjusting every year, you're after the initial period, and now you want to lock that rate in and, and fix those payments for whatever period you have left. So maybe you're 10 years into a 30-year loan and you go out and get a 20-year fixed rate loan to, again, give you some certainty for what those payments will be for the remainder of that. And then another reason um, is to use the equity in your home for some other purpose. So it could be that you have a $200,000 house and you owe $110,000. Um, well, you go get a refinancing and you get a new loan for $140,000, which essentially gives you $30,000 cash that can be used for something else. And I've certainly, um, you know, talked to people that have not used it for remodeling their home, some for college tuition, um, also had some that paid for some medical expenses. Um, maybe if you've done this, if you want to share what you might have used it for. Um, but essentially, those are assets that are available to you. Um, so sometimes people do do a what's called a cash out refinance, um, which again pulls cash out of that home and it can be used for some other purpose. Now one um, caution I will um, just mention, especially when housing prices were declining, let's assume that this example here, someone had done a refinancing and they had taken a $180,000 loan out, so now they only have 10% equity in the home. Um, and what if housing prices drop by 10%? What's the equity in their home? Well, it's gone to zero. Um, so then it can make it hard to sell and hard to refinance if you, if you can't cover the full amount of the loan. Um, so this was one of the issues that people kind of ran into when housing prices declined during the, the recession years. So be um, a little bit cautious about pulling money out, especially if you're getting anywhere near the, the total value of that home. It can really limit some options you might have um, down the road. So let's so here. So if you've refinanced, what was the reason that brought you in? Um, what was your main reason for doing that refinancing? All right, so most people wanted the lower interest payments. Uh, one, one was interested in lower monthly payments. Um, and I'm not too surprised that the uh, last two got uh, relatively few votes. So um, since we've got just a second here, let me just show you that uh, chart I mentioned a little bit earlier. All right, hopefully everyone um, is seeing this. Um, but this little chart here talks about your current monthly payment, what your new monthly payment, what those monthly savings are. It talks about um, subtracting your tax rate. This is only true if you're um, deducting your interest. So, um, but just to give you an idea, this is part of kind of a longer guide. It explains how to use that as well. So, but that was linked as well um, from our resources page. So, just want everybody to be aware of that um, resource. So. One of the things that's going to be key to making a decision about refinancing is, to, you know, to make sure that you do understand your current home loan, interest rate, what the balance is, um, property taxes, um, all of those kind of things. Um, any of you that have made extra payments along the way, the original amortization schedule, which is a list of your principal and interest payments on what they'll be over the next few years. Um, once you've made a, an extra payment at any point, that's not going to be accurate anymore. So if you haven't done any extra payments, that original loan paperwork is going to have all the information you need. Um, you can also go online and create one, but they're oftentimes going to ask how many payments are remaining. And again, if you've made extra payments, it's not going to work very well. Um, so you can go to um, choosetosave.org to create one 
or a better one is probably powerpay.org, which is from the University of Utah um, extension. So that will help you create um, a amortization schedule for your current loan. A couple of quick examples um, as we kind of wrap up here. Um, this is essentially a situation that um, came to my office a couple of years ago, but an individual who was getting ready, thinking about retiring, um, they had a mortgage balance of about uh, $47,000 at 6% interest. They're making um, payments of $910. Um, but Jill in this situation wasn't going to be able to afford $910 and still retire because her income was going to drop by about 25% uh, when she retired. Um, so she did, actually did a 15-year um, refinancing at that time. And uh, she rolled the extra costs of refinancing, which was a little less than $2,000, into her new loan. She got a lower rate because rates had dropped. She went to a 15-year loan, um, but it dropped her monthly payment um, to $350. Okay, so there was a big savings, $550 a month of lower payments. Now she's got to pay for instead of five years, she's got 10 years, 10 more years beyond that to pay going to pay an extra $7,000, um, but it helped Jill essentially meet that goal of being able to retire, to retire now rather than waiting. Um, really, for Jill's situation, it may have been waiting the additional five years until that was fully paid off. Otherwise, she just wasn't going to have the cash flow to be able to do that. So that can be a reason to retire. Um, this, again, was another um, one that came across my desk a while ago, but we had some folks that had a $125,000 mortgage with a 5% interest, and they had um, 22 years left on their loan. Um, interest rates had gone down, um, and they had uh, $81,000 is what they were going to pay. However, um, by going to a 15-year loan, including some costs, rolling that back in, a little bit lower interest rate, um, payments went up by about $135 and uh, seven less years of payments. So they were going to lower their interest payments um, by about $40,000 by one getting a lower rate and two paying it off a little bit more quickly. So um, a good reason you might want to consider um, refinancing if you're in that situation. So kind of decision time about a refinancing. There can be multiple reasons to refinance, so it's important to know what your goals are when you kind of go into it. Um, you know, if your goals are to save interest, stretching the length out probably isn't going to work. But if it's so that you can get a lower payment, so you can go to be a one-income family, you know, maybe you're willing to pay more interest over the life of it by stretching it out a little bit. So defining your goals up front, um, and then also thinking a little bit about the future. Um, how long are you going to stay in this home? Um, you know. Paying more up front or, or paying some costs related to refinancing to get a monthly savings can be wonderful. If it's going to take four years to recover your money and you plan to stay there for 10 years, it might be a great choice. If you move a year later, you may not have recovered all the expenses you went through for doing that. So it's hard to predict the future. Um, but again, if there's a high likelihood that you might be moving soon, um, you might be willing to put up with not um, refinancing for a little while. All right, um, before we take questions, um, if folks would take a moment here and fill out the evaluation questions, I would certainly appreciate it. Again, since I can't interact as well with you as I could at a live presentation, this is one of the ways that um, we try to get some feedback and find out how we're doing. All right, looks like most folks are done voting. All right, so hopefully everyone here can see the uh, question and answer pod again. If you've got any final questions or comments, um, please send those in. Um, and just a reminder, uh, three weeks from today, March 21st, Dr. Kerry Johnson will uh, be with us and talking about student loan repayment options. And uh, for those that have dealt with that, they expanded the options several years ago, which I think is probably good for borrowers, but it's also quite complex. Um, and then one month from today, Serene um, Greenway from University of Idaho um, will be talking about protecting yourself from financial scams. 
So I do have um, a question, and it is, uh, if I'm considering refinancing, will I have to submit a formal loan applications, or do I just negotiate with my current company? That's a great question. Um, it seems like you're renegotiating, but you're not. You're actually applying for a brand new loan. So you're going to go through the loan process just like um, you would normally. I would say the only uh, kind of change sometimes to the process is they obviously know exactly what property you're considering financing, as opposed to getting pre-approved for buying a home, where you may say, I just want a generic approval so I know what my budget is. Um, so they may or may not require a appraisal especially if the uh, value of the refinance is quite a bit less than the sort of estimated value of your home, they might waive the appraisal requirement, which they're not likely to do on a brand new loan. So thank you for that question. Okay, we've had one more question. Um, what about prepayment of my mortgage? Um, I have extra money each month. Should I refinance? to a higher payment level to pay it off quick, or should I just add extra to my um, current mortgage? Yeah, so almost all mortgages um, today are gonna let you add an additional principal payment each month, periodically, maybe only when you get your tax return, whatever you want. As long as you indicate it's for principal only, they will generally just apply that to your principal balance. So we talked a little bit about comparing monthly savings of say, you know, incurring maybe $2,000 of cost to refinance and maybe get a lower interest rate. Um, we could think about taking that $2,000 you would have spent um, to do a refinancing in terms of all the various fees and simply writing that as an extra check to your current mortgage company. Obviously, uh, that would pay down the principal balance some, which would lower some of your interest charges. So you could certainly do some math and decide which might be more advantageous to your situation, but it's certainly um, allowable. Um, very few mortgages um, have prepayment penalties um, at all. All right, and one final um, question looks like we've got here. Um, I keep having to make mortgage payments to a different company for the same loan. Why? Well, um, Mortgages are often resold in the secondary market, and then a bank or a company is asked to be what's called the servicer for the loan, and that's your interface, so that's the website you're making a payment to, or the address, or the company that the actual payments are going to, and then they redirect those payments to whoever owns the loan in whatever percentages. So what's happening in that case is the servicing of your loan has been transferred or sold um, to a different company. So they will keep you up to date on that. Um, doesn't affect the underlying terms of your loan, but it does affect what number you might call to contact someone. They may have some slightly different forms you have to fill out in terms of maybe an automatic uh, deduction from your checking account or something. Um, so yes, that can certainly happen, and no, there's not a lot you can do about it. Um, so. All right, well, it looks like we are out of time, and thank you for the questions today. Um, please mark your calendars for March 21st and March 28th for our final two sessions for this calendar year.